This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk to a different creative Mississippian. I'm your host, Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today, I'm speaking with Rita Brent. Rita is a comedian, musician, and veteran from Jackson, Mississippi. She also spent six years as a producer and host right here on MPB. Rita appeared on Cedric the Entertainer's Rock Your Brim comedy tour, and you may have seen her on Comedy Central's Heart of the City. A year ago, she released her album, Sip on This Tea, which she'll tell us a lot more about. Thank you so much for being here, Rita. How are you? Hi, Leslie. I'm doing as well as I can be, uh, <laughs> but all is, all is well. Currently in Brooklyn, New York, chilling, so I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh, so you're in Brooklyn. I didn't realize yes. you were in Okay. Okay. So do you live in Brooklyn now? Yes, temporarily. I moved from Mississippi to Brooklyn uh, last November and uh, things were going very well. And then the pandemic hit and I ended up back in Mississippi during the quarantine. So yeah, you know, just just kind of been all over the place and taking things day by day. So I want to go back to the beginning and talk about the whole journey and just you grew up in Jackson. Is that right? Yes, grew up in Jackson, born and raised, all of my schooling, John Hopkins Elementary, Northwest Middle School, um, then I went to Murrah High School, which is still the best in JPS, and graduated from Jackson State University, so yes, Jackson is uh, within my spirit. <laughs> okay, so you went to Murrah, I'm, I'm a big Murrah fan because I taught, my very first like real job after college was teaching at Power APAC down yeah. the hill. Murrah. So all of my students in the theater department were Murrah students and they were amazing. I'm super proud of all of them still, but so yeah, that's a short bus. Actually, it was a little short bus that came to pick me up from South Jackson and uh, took me to Murrah. Otherwise I was supposed to be going to Forest Hills. So yeah, I was, I was blessed that uh, my talents led me to Murrah. So were you in the APAC program? Yes. The music program. I was playing the drum set for Dr. Combs, who was an excellent teacher, and I hope he's still doing great. Oh, that's awesome. That That's mm-hmm. at home to me. That was right, the music department was right across the hall from my classroom. So that's, I didn't even know that. That's yeah. great. That's so, where I learned to play jazz music at Power APEC. Fourth grade, playing jazz. Didn't know anything about it. <laughs> you started in the fourth grade. Did you go all the way through 12th grade at APEC? Yes, uh, not music wise, academically, I did. Um, I joined the band. So that that music carried over to the marching band under Mr. Brian Jefferson at Merle. But yeah, I had no idea what I was doing in fourth grade playing jazz music. Now I have a great appreciation for it. So tell me a little bit about that journey. I mean, you know, you gave, you had a great start with the music, with the performance, but how did your time there, your time in Jackson inform who you grew up to be, who, who you are now? Well, I have to give a lot of credit to, well, most of the credit uh, outside of God to my mother, who is a very progressive woman. And I think she was progressive ahead of her time because she's the one who put me on a drum set at the age of eight in church. She is a piano player and a singer. And uh, one Sunday, the original drummer didn't show up, and my mom told me to get on the drums. And I guess she just assumed that because she had the musical gene, I had it too, and she (laughs) was correct. Uh, So I'm eight years old on the drum set playing with my mom. And then we started doing talent shows. She would accompany me, and I would be on drum set singing and twirling the sticks and just uh, having a great time. And yeah, she just always kept pushing me to perform because I guess she saw something in me. And it turns out that, that she was right. So I give a lot of credit to my mother for helping cultivate my talents and not looking at it like, oh, she's a girl. She shouldn't play the drum. She shouldn't play basketball. She has always been a huge supporter uh, for anything I, I've done. So my upbringing in music and entertainment is a direct reflection of my mother's teaching and support. So music was your gateway to entertaining, it sounds like. Absolutely. I really thought 
I was going to grow up and play drum set for Prince. That's what I thought. I, I had no idea That's I would dream. venture off into comedy. I just, I just always thought I would, my claim to fame would be music. And so I was preparing myself to perform at the time. I just didn't know that at some point I would come from behind the drum set and be center stage as a comedian. You know, I was actually going to ask you, did you always know you wanted to be a comedian? And it sounds like, no, you didn't. But were you always funny? I mean, I don't, were you funny? But did you Absolutely. always like to make jokes and stuff? Absolutely. I did. I was that person. I was the, the class clown. I got some kind of satisfaction from making people laugh. But I just never put two and two together. Like, hey, you can actually do this for a living. I just thought this is something you did among friends and family uh, to get some laughs. And then as I got older, I was like, oh, okay, comedians are, they have real jobs and this is a profession. So it took me well into my mid twenties to realize that I could be a comedian. So before then I was just a funny person in the room uh, telling jokes for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you just tuned in, I'm Leslie Barker with the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today on the Arts Hour, I'm talking with my guest, Rita Brent, comedian. And so, so tell us a little bit how the journey started to shift. Well, I'm sure there's a lot more with the music in your future before we get to comedy. So what did it look like after high school? What, what happened next? So after high school, I was 18, and uh, someone from church mentioned the Army Band to me, and I just thought that was a foreign term. I didn't know there was a such thing as the Army Band. And he's like, yeah, you can get your tuition paid for, you get a GI Bill check, you get a drill check. And so I heard dollar signs and music, <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm going to join the Army, Army Band. And I got a little resistance from my mom at first because she was thinking, oh, my baby going to go to war. But as I tell people, uh, I was in absolutely no danger. You, you really don't have to say thank you for sacrificing your life to me because I didn't sacrifice nothing. I was in the parades and things like that. I never went to war. I, you know, I know how to shoot a weapon, but I, my main weapon was drumsticks. So uh, <laughs> I, I joke with people about that. But yeah, straight out of high school, I joined the Army Band and I stayed in for nine years and uh, continued my music career in the Army Band where we played jazz music, we played symphonic band music, rock music, you name it. And that was a great time for me from the standpoint of becoming disciplined and uh, mm. you know, learning how to manage money, learning how to work with other people. And of course, from a musical standpoint, it really just broadened my horizons about all the styles of music I could play. And of course, I grew a deeper appreciation for the military and serving the country. So that was 18 straight out the gate. I joined the army and went to basic training, which was wild. <laughs> Where did you travel? Where all were you? So uh, for basic, that's probably as far as I went. That was uh, Fort, ja Fort Jackson, South Carolina. They mm -hmm. call it Relaxing Jackson because it's supposed to be one of the easier uh, basic training posts. And then after that, I went to Norfolk, Virginia to go to the, Ar to the Navy School of Music. And so uh, when I was in the Army, actually, the, mostly the traveling we did was around the state of Mississippi. And uh, we just performed for retirement ceremonies or went to veterans' homes. And it was, it was a great time. There's a, a high regard for people in the military, regardless what you did. And I really mm -hmm. did enjoy my time in service. When did the music start shifting to comedy for you? When was that light bulb moment or, or gradual moment? whatever it was for you? Yeah, it was just a definitive decision because mm. I could have kept playing music. I was playing with all kinds of folks, Dexter Allen. Um, I made it on BET with an all-girl band. We were, we were doing some great things. And one night in Jackson, Mississippi, there was a place called Sweet 106 where they were having a comedy show and I was just attending as a guest. And while I was sitting there, uh, as I listened to the comedians, I started getting butterflies. And huh. literally the voice of God spoke to me and said, you can do this. And I thought, huh. It was as if I was going to go up to perform. That's how nervous I was sitting there listening because I knew uh, this is something that I want to do. And so once I felt that in my belly, I reached out to the host of the comedy show, Kenneth Allen. And I said, hey, man, I think I want to try comedy. And he's like, cool. And a couple weeks later, 
I did it. I did about five minutes and I think I got $25. And I was like, oh, this is lit. Okay, you can pay, <laughs> you can get paid for this. And I remember my mom came, she had just left church. So she had on a full church suit watching me perform in this in this little club, do comedy for the first time. And yeah, that was uh, seven years ago. <laughs> seven years ago. What was that moment, the first moment on stage, center stage, doing your comedy? What was that like? It was uh, unnerving. I mean, I was, I was absolutely nervous. I think I went to the bathroom probably five times before I hit the stage. Like, you would have thought I was performing for the, the correspondence dinner, how nervous I was <laughs> for a five-minute set. And that has not changed to this day. I get so nervous to the point that I still have to use the bathroom before I get on stage but a good friend Ricky Smiley told me if you're nervous that means that you you care so that night I was very nervous but I had written a little set down and I got a couple chuckles not as many as I would have liked and that night I said wow this is really empowering let me take this seriously and then I just decided I want to be a comedian I didn't want to call myself a comedian right off the bat because I knew I hadn't done the research or put in enough work to be called a comedian just yet, but I knew it was something that I wanted to do. And I won a little competition novice and I got novice comedian of the year. And so I was like, okay, well, people must see something in me. Let me take it seriously and see what happens. I love the idea of taking comedy seriously, you know, Mm -hmm. just because so my background's in theater and I, from my perspective, the hardest like emotion or the hardest thing to draw from an audience, like I I direct plays, I don't act, but Mm -hmm. the hardest thing to get to is getting an audience to laugh. So my Mm. respect, my respect for comedians is just huge. I mean, I feel, I feel like, and I think that's why so many amazing comedians are also really great dramatic actors, because I Mm -hmm. think if you can tap into what makes people laugh, you can tap into just about any emotion. Do you, have mm-hmm. you found that to be true? Absolutely. I consider my comedic skills a superpower. I mean, mm. I can break down barriers, you know, when uh, there's something that's tense, even like a meeting or something, you know, you say something funny and then the tension breaks in the room. It really is a superpower for me. Um, but also I use it as a tool to kind of massage pain, you know, mm. when the the moment that my comedy career shifted is when I started being honest about how I was feeling while I was going through my divorce. And mm. when I tapped into uh, kind of making fun of my pain, but in a very sincere way, then folks started reaching out and said, hey, you kind of helped me break through some things tonight that I was dealing with because I'm going through a divorce as well. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this is much deeper than I initially thought. So yes, it's definitely a superpower. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm talking with comedian Rita Brent. So uh, Rita, we just listened to your song. If if people are listening live on the radio, uh, Can You Rock Me Like a Pothole, which (laughs) definitely, definitely had some inspiration from Jackson, as you mentioned, (laughs) right? And I I think if you live in Jackson, you probably relate. Um, But I want to talk about some other ways that your roots in Mississippi, your your time here uh, just has worked its way into your comedy. Mm Mm-hmm. 
you know, writing that song was a way for me to kind of ease the spirits of people because on Facebook I had seen a lot of complaining about potholes and just a lot of bad mouthing about Jackson, even from outsiders who were not here and don't don't have an idea of the culture that exists within the city. So I wrote the song uh, to just kind of ease people's minds a little bit. Like, hey, we have potholes, but is it really that big of a deal? Uh, so I just tried to change the narrative. And, you know, the potholes have since been fixed on that street. So, uh, yeah, it, yeah. So, you know, the song worked in, in a mysterious way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, most comedians will tell you uh, most good comedians, they will teach you about themselves in their mm. comedy. Uh, recently, I was in uh, at a rooftop show in New York, and there was a Southern comedian, which you don't often see in New York. He was from Texas, and he just brought us into his world, you know, about horseback riding, and he had all these funny things, and he was teaching us about himself and about his state. And so that's something that I like to do in my comedy. Uh, I like to elevate my state because I'm from here and I have a different perspective than people who are just on the outside looking in speculating but also hold my state accountable because we mm -hmm. you know do some some questionable things and when I say we you know some of the leadership they do questionable things and it reflects badly uh, to other people in the world so I address those things in my comedy to try to give people some perspective and uh, I do not shy away from the hard topics. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I love hearing you talk about that. It's, it's just, and it's so evident if you listen to your comedy, which I do advise everyone to listen to your album, Sip on This Tea, support Rita, buy a copy of the album. But um, adults, adults listen to adult, it. Take adults, adults. <laughs> take your children out of the room, wait till they go to sleep. <laughs> you have been warned. So there you go. <laughs> um, but, you know, I am so curious. I want to talk to you more about that. But you mentioned something about being in New York and hearing a, a comic from a comedian from the South. I'm so curious as to how it's different for you when your audience mm -hmm. is Southern and when you're somewhere else. Yeah. So that was a huge challenge for me coming to New York. I thought, Am I going to have to adjust and start talking about the stuff that New Yorkers are talking about? Or do I just remain true to myself? And uh, Roy Wood Jr., who is an amazing comedian from Alabama, who has been doing wonderfully in New York for a while now. He's on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. He specifically told me, do not change. You know, you are from Mississippi. That is your thing. That's what you talk about. That's what makes you different. And so I said, well, that, that's awesome that I get to be myself. I get to be authentic and tell my story and bring people into my world instead of having them bring me into their world. So that has just been my approach. You know, when I'm on stage, the first thing I talk about is, hey, I'm from Mississippi. I'm not from around here. And I'll talk a little noise about New York and the things that are I <laughs> here. You know, it's like y'all have all this to say about us in Mississippi. But there are some weird things here as well. Like the whole city smells like urine. That is a problem. Um, I said, you know, this should be called the big bladder instead of the big apple. So, uh, you know, I, I have a different perspective than those who grew up in New York. Our material is completely different. And that in turn helps me to stand out. And so mm. that has been that has been great because I thought I was going to have to get here and change up the way I spoke. But people appreciate the fact that I'm from Mississippi because they they know about the history uh, they see the things in the news and we get to have conversations about that. So I get to redeem my state in a sense. Absolutely. You know, on, on your album, there's a, a quote that you said that like particularly stuck out to me. I actually went back and listened to it a couple of times and mm -hmm. you said, our story needs to be retold mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. Mississippians. And so I just, I think, you know, you've been talking about this, but I want to dive a little deeper into it. How, can you as a comedian help do that? And then let's talk about how other artists can do that too, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, like I would love to hear about some of those conversations you've had with people or just how you, how you tell that story. I think a lot of the opinions about Mississippi and the South in general I think a lot of them are what I call sheep-like thinking. They, mm -hmm. they come from sheep-like thinking. You hear one narrative on the news and that's what you adopt. Without, some people have never even been to Mississippi. 
But you ask him, well, what do you think about Mississippi? Oh, yeah, I know how they are down there, you know. And I get that from the sense of historically, you hear about Emmett Till. Historically, you hear about James Meredith. You hear about Megar Evers. But the stories are deeper than that. You know, racism is, it, it does, it is the thread of Mississippi. But there's also a lot of evolution happening. If you go to the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, um, that's how you can get informed about the state. So I think people just lack information and they hold the people accountable for the state's evils. And that's the part that I have a problem with. Like, mm -hmm. don't, don't judge me or try to peg me as a certain way just because I'm from Mississippi without knowing who I am as a person. Um, so, you know, when I am speaking with people and they've had a conversation with me, an intelligent conversation, and then I say I'm from Mississippi, they act shocked because mm -hmm. they think that, you know, we, we're, we're slaves or something in Mississippi and, and that we walk around barefoot and we still ride in the horse and buggy. And it's just not uh, the reality of what Mississippi is now. The state is evolving as we see from the Confederate flag being taken down, which is mm -hmm. a huge step in the right direction. So my job as a comedian is to inform inform folks yes this is who we were as a state but this is where we are now and this is where we're headed mm -hmm. so just trying to reimagine um reimagine the state and and its character and its personality because there is a a sheep-like thinking surrounded uh, by mississippi right now that i i personally am trying to change absolutely you're listening to MPB Think Radio. Uh, this is the Mississippi Arts Hour, and I'm your host, Leslie Barker, talking with Rita Brent. Um, so I love, you know, this idea of, you know, using an art form, whatever your art form may be, to tell your story, to tell the story of a place, and with you specifically, Mississippi. And um, I'm so I'm so interested to hear what what is your Mississippi story? You know, what is, what do you want people to know about this place that you come hmm. from? Interesting. So in my comedy, I just joke about the hospitality in Mississippi. I mm -hmm. joke about, you know, when you come to Mississippi, you get the best of everything. You get the best food, you get the best music, you get the best homophobia, you get the best bigotry. <laughs> you know, I, I say you get the best of everything when you come to Mississippi, but um, it is a it is a unique state uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that when you go certain places, you feel things as a black woman that may make you feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. But but on the flip side of that, I'll have people come up to me and say, hey, I appreciate your work. I appreciate your voice. So to me, that shows that there is growth. There's been some evolution. There's been some progression. So my story is. I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, where I was called the N-word mm. in the fourth grade, okay, in the fourth grade by a fellow student. And here I am at 33 doing car commercials for a major car dealership, which is Patty Peck Honda. Mm. You know, that is growth that a, a black girl from Mississippi, a little black girl, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey speaks to this all the time can go from being called the n-word in the fourth grade and wondering what that meant and and, and f feeling belittled to being the face of a car dealership in mississippi so t my story is that there is hope you know we we don't have to be stuck in the past there is hope for the future and even in my special you know i came out of the closet on stage and that is something that i have been afraid to do forever you know, I've known who I was sexually since I was at Murrah High School, mm -hmm. but because I was in Mississippi, you have the stint of racism that you have to deal with. I didn't want to throw homophobic stuff on top of that. But at mm -hmm. the age of 33 in Mississippi, I felt comfortable enough to do that. I said, this state has progressed enough to where I can do this live in real time in front of 500 strangers and I won't get beat up or booed off the stage. And so, you know, my story is just a story of hope and progression and that I know my state is headed to better things because I am evidence of that uh, because of the compassion and some of the acceptance that has been shown toward me uh, as a black woman who's now openly uh, representing the LGBTQ community. And you mentioned earlier 
that you've had other people say, thank you so much for that. I connect with that story. I can only imagine that, that that's true with, with that as well, you know, with you, Mm -hmm. with your coming out story and, and I can only imagine how empowering it is for someone else in Mississippi who might be struggling with that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in a sense, a lot of people are coming out of their closets in Mississippi. Mm. You know, there are some, uh, some, some white people out there who are not fans of the Confederate flag and they're having to come out and say, you know what, I don't agree with this flag. Mm -hmm. And that is a risk for some folks because that's an alienation. Uh, it could be an alienation from the folks who thought, oh, we thought you were on our side, you know. Uh, so mm-hmm. a lot of people are coming out of their respective closets, whether it's dealing with race, whether it's dealing with sexu- sexuality, whether it's dealing with uh, gen- matters of gender, you know, and, and that's very encouraging to see. It's very encouraging to see. And I think that narrative is going to start to shift for us nationally. And I think the Confederate flag was the beginning of that because I did talk about it uh, in a special before the sip on this tea, I talked about it. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of people have things to say that they have been afraid to say before. And now they're like, you know what, this is what I stand for. Um, and if you don't like it, oh, well, this, this is worth the risk of being, being on the right side of history. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, what I love about the arts and, and, artists is that bravery to share stories because I think it's so healing and just hearing you Mm -hmm. talk about it is is so evident in your own story in the stories that you've shared for the place you know healing for the state healing for people in your audience and so I just want to say thank you for doing that Um, oh yes it takes it takes a little courage now because once (laughs) you put it out there you can't take it back uh, but but the impact is what matters for me. It, it's mm-hmm. not enough to just make people laugh and, you know, just to, to get a cheap laugh. That's not enough. If you can leave my show and say, I felt some kind of mental breakthrough because of your honesty mm-hmm. and your vulnerability, Rita, then I know I have done my part because I did get tons of messages that night saying, hey, I've been dealing with my own sexuality and you helped me deal with that. I spoke about, you know, feeling suicidal at some point after my Mm -hmm. divorce. It's just like the more vulnerable you are, you show people that they are not alone. You know, we're all in this together and you can heal through me. I can heal through you. So once I realized that big picture with my platform, I said, okay, this is a huge responsibility that I want to take seriously and, and help heal people as I heal myself. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Leslie Barker from the Mississippi Arts Commission, and today I'm speaking with stand-up comedian Rita Brent. So, Rita, right before the break, we talked about your song, The Quarantine Shuffle, Mm -hmm. which, which I think we all understand where the <laughs> where the inspiration came from on that one uh, yes. I think we're, we're all living we're all living it with you but um you you were on a pretty important major tour right before this happened so tell us about about that tour and and everything that was going on with that yeah my schedule was so full as I look back over my life I was like man um so yeah that weekend of March 12th, I was supposed to be performing alongside Cedric the Entertainer. I think we were supposed to be in Minnesota or somewhere. And um, then it just got canceled. And Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, man, because I had done a few dates with Cedric. And like, that's a big deal. He is definitely a legend in the comedy game. 
He has a, a great show called The Neighbors. And it was just a blessing to be on tour with him. And so I was about to have yet another big date with Cedric and then it was canceled, um, along with a lot more of my um, tour dates. It was like either rescheduled or canceled altogether. And I had to completely convert to doing virtual gigs. So to date, I've done at least 50 or 60 Zoom gigs, which is a complete, completely different uh, realm of performing. I'm usually in my bedroom in front of a wall and may or may not have pants on. Folks <laughs> may or may not be listening, you know, depending on if they're on mute or unmute. Uh, somebody could be hollering at their children in the middle of my set. So it, it has been very different adjusting to performing during the pandemic and figuring out how to still create and uh, deliver some kind of message creatively. You know, I know that when you have a live performance, whatever it is, whether it's music or theater or, or comedy, I would say even especially comedy, that live exchange is so vital and it, mm. changes, it changes the show, right? I mean, I would say, you know, whoever's in the audience is going to contribute to what, what the vibe is for the whole evening. Um, yes. So how how does that feel? Like, how does it feel differently when it's virtual compared to being in the room? Oh, it's completely awkward. I mean, there's no way to get around it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had some really good shows. Um, the, the, the greatest thing for me is that I just get to perform. I turn my phone off and come in the living room and watch Netflix. So I have <laughs> enjoyed not having to travel a lot because that mm -hmm. is, most comedians will tell you, uh, the stress comes from actually traveling, not necessarily performing the show. Uh, this is New York, so you may hear those sirens in the background. But uh, I mean, it's it's been it's been challenging. I, at first, I didn't want to do them at all. I was like, I, mm. I, how am I going to perform on Zoom? And then my bank account was like, Yeah, you're going to have to do them. And so I just started doing them, and they are just rolling in now. Uh, you know, throughout the end of the year, I have shows on Zoom, which is something I, I never thought I would be saying. But you know, maybe it's just a realization and epiphany for everybody that. Um, there are alternative ways to do things and mm -hmm. and it just opened my eyes to this fact uh, also it showed me that really good wi-fi matters <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that has been more essential to me than bathing actually having good wi-fi <laughs> so uh, doing performing virtually it has allowed me me to at least just calm down a little bit and reevaluate things like well, where is my career going what is the message that I'm putting out there so it has been a sobering moment for me I'm sure at some point I'll get back on